All right. Good evening, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the De La Viega Focus Town Hall meeting tonight. I am your first district supervisor, Manu Koenig. Joining me on the call tonight are Jamie Seahorn and Shane McKeithen, both first district analysts. And uh, we'll go. I'm going to give a short slide presentation to begin with, and then we'll should have plenty of time for questions and answers. Thank you for joining on this rainy evening. Uh, I am going to start by talking uh, about some updates about the March storm, which we are sort of in the middle of. Uh, it's really supposed to intensify later this evening, um, but I'll share everything I know there and some of the resources that are available through the county. And then uh, because it is, as I said, uh, we rotate these meetings throughout the first district and uh, tonight's was was going to be held as a hybrid meeting at De La Viega Elementary School as well as online. However, because of the weather, we decided to just make it all online, um, but we'll still focus on some uh, issues that are related to the Prospect Heights De La Viega area at the, the end of the meeting. So we'll go ahead and get started. So we are, as I said, in the middle of another atmospheric river storm, um, and we have uh, issued evacuation orders, the sheriff has for low-lying areas throughout the county. I've highlighted here on this slide some of the areas in the first district, which include uh, Soquel Village, as well as uh, the Capitola Village area. Other areas that were flooded back in January should also be on alert and are also under an evacuation warning. So the warning is different from an order in that it just means that folks should be prepared to receive an evacuation order to leave, uh, but they do not are not required to do so at the moment. Uh, but yeah, other areas that are under a warning include Felton, Aptos, and Watsonville, and as I said, SoCal and Capitola Village. The, if you go to the county's website, it, you can even just search Santa Cruz County and uh, click on the first link in Google and then go to the homepage. You'll see the March storm information link, and that includes some of the resources that I'll walk through right now. One of the ones I like to track is the stream gauges. Um, so this is under uh, current information. If you click on the, uh, the, the, the creek level, water level, um, link, you'll get to first this screen. If you click water level and current stage levels map, you get to this map, which shows you really all of the major stream gauges in the county and pretty up to date information about where those, uh, how those different uh, creeks and rivers are doing at the moment. So as you can see here, I had clicked on the dot for Soquel Creek and it shows you the water level within the last 30 minutes. So things are tracking okay right now, um, but really uh, I think they were about three and a half feet. This is a back at uh, four o'clock when I took this screenshot. But folks should be prepared uh, for some pretty rapid rises in the creek and uh, San Lorenzo River and Pajaro River. As This is looking at some historic data back from first the New Year's Eve storm. You can see water level was tracking right around the same level, three and a half, four feet. Uh, and then when those major rains started, uh, really shot up pretty quickly. I think it was uh, about three and a half feet in, in a couple hours. And then this second graph is from January 9th, when we, the second time we saw flooding in the Soquel Village. And uh, you can see here, actually, the water level shot up even faster just because our soils were so saturated at that point after uh, just weeks of storms. So you, the bulk of the rain is expected tonight around 4, 3, 4 in the morning. So uh, if you are in one of these evacuation warning areas, you might want to check the stream gauges before you go to sleep um, and also just be prepared to, to evacuate. If that order is issued, uh, then the uh, the sheriff deputies will be going around door to door to tell folks to get out. For Soquel Creek, the uh, the order 
evacuation order would come at 13 feet and then the creek actually floods at 16 feet but you can see sometimes there's not a whole lot of time between those two some of the resources available there are um, still sandbags i haven't checked to see if these locations are open at this very moment although you can call any of these numbers i've highlighted some of the ones uh, that are in the mid-county area at branch of 40 fire central fire and socal village uh, county parking lot there's also one uh, up at the Burl Station on Highland Way in the upper part of the first district. Uh, so if, if you haven't gotten any sandbags yet, you can check uh, those spots. Also, if you do need to evacuate, there's a list of the shelter sites that are available. The primary one in the first district is this Cabrillo College Gym, which opens uh, just about in an hour at 7 p.m. tonight. And it has capacity for 100 people. It is ADA compliant. And uh, if you do bring pets, bring, bring a carrier. You can see a list of other sites here, including Watsonville Vets Hall, Ramsey Park, the Crosetti Hall, Santa Cruz County uh, Fairgrounds, Depot Park, which has an overnight warming center, and Scotts Valley Community Center. You'll also find a link at that uh, county March storm page for road conditions. These are county maintained road advisories, including roads that are just impacted. Those are the little red rain cloud, as well as roads that are actually closed. So you can see on here currently, uh, Glenwood Drive is closed uh, and um, some other areas here highway, uh, on Highway 9 and 236. But that information is real time. Uh, you can also call road operations 24-hour dispatch if you have a new issue that's developing. It's this 831-477-3999 number. Uh, again, those folks are there all night uh, and would be happy to take your call and get a road crew, crew out to any emerging issues as quickly as possible. Okay, now just a little bit more general information about some of the things we're doing uh, as far as storm preparedness. I know this information uh, that such as I just shared is helpful, but for folks, particularly if you're in the mountains, um, you know, having uh, backup power for communications infrastructure is essential to actually be able to access the internet and access that, that information, uh, as well as to just communicate with uh, friends and loved ones about um, so this situation. So we have contacted Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, and Front Frontier regarding backup power options for all of their cell towers um, and distribution points. Um, for the most part, it, none of those uh, most of those providers did not have too many active projects, but Comcast did have a lot. We discovered they had 15 pending permits with our county, um, and so we've created a plan to get those backup. Uh, power sites installed as quickly as possible. So mostly batteries, since these areas are in the wildlife urban interface. And so generators will not always be appropriate. It could increase fire risk. Um, we've listed seven uh, of them as an immediate priority. And our planning department is committed to processing those applications within the next five to 10 business days. Uh, it might take 10 business days for battery uh, stations that do require retaining wall projects, but we are we are basically moving as quickly as possible to get those installed. I should say the county itself has been dealing with issues of backup power. This this image you have here of the snow cat, that's actually from the top of Loma Prieta during those storms we had uh, a couple of weeks ago with the snow, where one of the major transponders for the fire department uses that um, was at, it's at, it's way at the end of an 88 mile PG&E line, uh, and that power line was cut in multiple places. We had to um, it, the existing backup generator was failing, and we had to get this Cal OES Snowcat uh, so that we could get several just off the shelf generators to the station. Uh, and we kept it fueled and powered with um, even replacing one of the generators over the next. Uh, uh, multiple days as we dealt with that power outage. So this is an issue that we're seeing across the county uh, and doing everything we can to address it quickly. I understand Comcast was able to, to get one uh, backup battery station installed just in the last week. If you're still dealing with uh, recovery issues, whether it's from to your home or 
uh, private road. The disaster recovery centers are still open. The deadline is rapidly approaching though for applying for, uh, for assistance from the January storms. So it's March 16th, which uh, so next week, you've got to get those applications in. If you need to do so, there is a disaster recovery center in the basement of the county building at 701 Ocean Street, as well as at the city government center in Watsonville. Those are the one at 701 Oceans open from nine to five, Monday through Friday, and the Watsonville Disaster Recovery Center is open 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Saturday. We have, we've also heard a lot of uh, issues with branches that are down throughout the mountains and uh, along roadways. We, Public Works does, does have a regular vegetation clearing program that runs May through October, um, and that will happen certainly this year regardless. But debris clearing, sp specifically from the winter storms, is ongoing. And so, again, you can call those that road operations number, the 24-hour dispatch, 831-477-3999. And uh, you can that that goes directly to the crews uh, who are on the road, and so you're most likely to get fastest service that way. But if you see a lingering issue or something that hasn't been dealt with, you're welcome to also reach out to our office, first.district at santacruzcounty.us, and send us the details of a specific location along a county maintained road that needs service, and we'll work, work with Public Works to get that cleared. I should specify that. There are privately maintained roads are not eligible for this type of branch clearing. Uh, you know, we've got 600 miles of county maintained roads to deal with, and so we just cannot offer service on, on privately maintained roads. However, the Resource Conservation District is starting up their spring no cost chipping program very soon. In fact, April 1st registration opens, and so you can go to rcdsantacruz.org slash chipping programs. And uh, on April 1st, you'll be able to, to get in there and submit your application. And, um, and th that's a, a great, well-used program. You know, throughout these storms, of course, we've also uh, really tried to both remove people from harm's way and also make sure that more trash is not entering our waterways by clearing some of the encampments. Uh, you know, thank God that we got the San Lorenzo Benchlands camp cleared. Uh, that was, of course, with about two and a half million dollars of state money, as well as um, a lot of teamwork with the city of Santa Cruz between the city and the county. Uh, and you know that area, of course, completely flooded. This is a picture from January 9th. So um, about 20% of those folks went to, uh, took us up on the services we offered and moved to uh, one of the other uh, shelter sites we're operating, including up at the Armory at De La Viega. Um, as well as over at the Housing Matters campus. I'm also happy to report that we were able to clean a, a, another encampment that was behind Emmeline. Um, just in time, we were able to install some emergency uh, levees to prevent uh, all this trash from entering the waterway with Carbonara Creek. And uh, the cleanup has been ongoing since uh, beginning of this year. And we should see uh, a, a clean site there soon. Uh, I am aware, I have been consistently been messaging from, um, from many folks about the folks who are camping in their cars along Grand Safari Drive, as well as within De La Viega Park. Uh, you know, we'll certainly work with, uh, this is, it's an interesting area, it's right along the border of county and city jurisdiction, the city's park. Uh, that is the, it's the city's park, and so the police department enforces the laws there. And then along the roadway, um, the, the sheriff enforces the law. So it's really a, a, a team effort here. Uh, we'll continue enforcement, certainly, whenever uh, to, to get people out there so they can't park overnight. Um, we are also looking at, besides just the enforcement, actual engineering additional solutions. So uh, whether it's K rail or a split rail fence here to prevent parking along the side of the road, we're trying to identify funding to install that infrastructure, uh, as well as expanding shelter uh, and safe parking spaces that people actually have somewhere to go. And then once we've identified that, those resources, uh, city parks is ready to clear the encampment from De La Viega Park. Part of the reason that folks have been camping or parking along the side of the road here is that there is a larger 
encampment in De La Viega. And so it's, uh, it will really be a combined effort once we have some additional resources lined up uh, and then we can install the fence, whether that's a K rail or split rail fence. I'll speak to some of the other behavioral resources, behavioral health resources that we're bringing online. Um, exciting news that we got funding uh, through a couple of state grants to open a new children's crisis stabilization unit. So for children suffering from a mental health crisis right now, uh, we have a just a few limited beds at our uh, crisis stabilization unit along SoCal Avenue, um, but that's that's frequently been overwhelmed. And so we're opening a new uh, center specifically for children. We acquired the 5300 SoCal Ave building, which is at the Sheriff Center. And within the next year, we'll be able to open eight uh, crisis st stabilization beds. Uh, and again, this is all for youth and 16 residential beds for longer term treatment. Right now, any youth that are in a longer term mental health crisis have to actually go outside of the county. So that's really tragic and it's good to be able to be bringing these services back to the county where uh, so the kids can remain at home. In the meantime, we are, of course, even if it, though the, you know it's great we have this center coming, uh, it is gonna take about a year to renovate the building for this new purpose. It's an office building now. Uh, so we are exploring options for interim service location, including talking to Watsonville Hospital uh, and looking at higher additional service providers to help fill the gap there. You also may have heard about the CARE Court program that the state has launched. Uh, so every county in California is going to be required to have a CARE Court. This is essentially a process that... Uh, allows people who need some kind of uh, behavioral health treatment um, but are not getting it on their own. Um, it allows a third party, whether that's um, a friend or loved one or uh, a concerned community member to initiate a care court process uh, whereby we create a managed treatment plan for somebody. And um, other larger counties such as San Francisco are piloting this um, beginning this year. And our county is going to be required to implement it in December of next year, 2024. So still, still a ways away. Uh, but our county team is meeting quarterly to review learnings from the pilot regions, as well uh, as to plan implementation in our own county. You know, I'll, I'll, of course, there are a lot of big transportation projects coming up this summer. Once the rains end, typically uh, beginning of July, we enter construction season. And uh, in fact, the so the, the Highway 1 is gonna be seeing some major construction. You may have noticed some of the trees coming down uh, already. That's really just to make sure that when we begin that construction later this summer, um, you know, birds haven't started nesting in those trees. Uh, we wanted to they have to clear those trees before the nesting season begins so that uh, we don't run into any conflict there. This is a, the highway one is uh, has a three phase project coming up to add auxiliary lanes and a bus on shoulder. Um, that's sort of similar to the project that was already done between the fish hook and Morrissey. And this will extend it all the way to Freedom Boulevard ultimately. So phase one is SoCal Drive to 41st Avenue. Phase two is 41st uh, to State Park Drive. And then phase three is State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard. And at this point, phase two is sort of caught up with phase one. Both of those phases are fully funded and will begin construction this summer. And phase three, uh, we have received a $30 million mega grant from the Federal Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Uh, it's one of just nine mega grants allocated uh, around the whole country and the only one in the state of California. So pretty incredible that our county got this. Um, and we are going to, this phase three is incredibly expensive because of Aptos Creek and um, the challenges with two rail bridges there. So uh, it, the total cost is going to be about 200 million of, of that phase. We're hoping we get additional state money to finish it. But I mentioned this um, because not only is it, the highway is going to be under construction this summer, we'll also begin work on the 
buffered uh, bike lane and um, congestion mitigation project for SoCal Drive. It'll be a little bit less intensive, um, mostly involves installing uh, some new traffic lights, the 22 smart lights that will be wired together with fiber optic cable. So they'll be able to adapt and maximize traffic flow. They'll also be able to um, talk to the buses so that they can give transit some priority. And um, it, it, if a bus is, is coming, the lights will stay green a little bit longer. If a bus is waiting, it will turn green sooner. And then at the same time, we're putting in buffered and protected bike lanes along SoCal Drive. Uh, again, between uh, the SoCal Drive, well, actually from about Harbor High to State Park Drive in Aptos. Um, so that's great, but the fact that both of these projects are happening this summer does mean that there uh, will almost certainly be more congestion as um, the construction is happening. So that brings me back to a option for a local project here in the De La Viega neighborhood that we've been looking at, which is designating a bike boulevard from downtown along the Riverwalk up into the uh, De La Viega Prospect Heights neighborhood. Uh, the yellow light, uh, the, the yellow route here that you see uh, is basically all uh, low stress streets where traffic is not moving as fast. So uh, it takes you up Berkeley Way to Linden Street. Um, and then once you get into Prospect Heights, of course, there's speed bumps. Um, and, um, and, and then this way through Prospect Heights is actually designated within the active transportation plan for the city of Santa Cruz as uh, you know, a pros um, Prospect Heights Greenway. So I'm interested uh, for anyone here calling in from the De La Viega neighborhood, whether this is of interest to you, uh, we are talking to the city about uh, just really putting up some signage for this um, and maybe some other minor um, traffic calming improvements. Uh, there's some folks that have indicated they're willing to donate for this, um, but do, we do need to now demonstrate some interest. I've been talking to Martine Watkins, who this route is largely uh, council member Watkins. Uh, this route is largely in her now city district uh, since the city moved to to district so that each council member has a specific area of representation um, and so she just wants to make sure that this is something that people actually want um, in a different area we're looking at uh, on bromer and broadway uh, trying to get better green bike lanes designated there uh, particularly on bromer the county side does not have any green paint at the moment um, so we're looking at the possibility of a project um, as well as you know some bollards and stuff to improve bike safety there again these are just projects that we could stand up relatively quickly and um and and hopefully provide some kind of alternative as, as we deal with the construction over the next couple of years so that's all i've got is uh in the way of slides and i'm happy to take any questions that you guys have now um so the way we'll do this is if you click the little reactions button in the bottom of the screen, the little smiley face with the plus and click raise hand, uh, then we'll call on people in the order that uh, you raise your hand. And we just ask that um, before we call on you that you do include uh, your a, a real name uh, on the on the screen as well as uh, turn on your camera because uh, we have had problems with Zoom bombers in the past. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and begin with Katie Hansen. Hi, sorry, I can't have my, I'm, I'm cooking dinner, so I don't have my camera on. Um, question just about the bike boulevard. It, can you describe it like what is it a protected bike lane? It, like what is what does the bike boulevard entail specifically? Yeah, so this is actually a route that um, doesn't need a whole lot of additional infrastructure other than just some signage. And the reason is that they're already neighborhood streets. Um, so for example, Linden and Berkeley Way uh, don't, don't get a whole lot of uh, car through traffic, right? Other than folks going to their homes. So you don't have cars traveling faster than 25 or even 20 miles an hour. So it's a much more comfortable environment to bike on, uh, particularly if you have kids. 
Um, and so really, this is a, is an approach that looks at how can we just use the infrastructure we have better, make people aware of these routes um, so that, uh, you know, they're, they feel safe when they're on the road and are more likely to get out. Um, you know, the, the biggest impediment that surveys have shown to people uh, taking a bike for transportation is just a feeling of safety on the roads, uh, which is totally understandable. It's, a, it's an ongoing issue for our county. Uh, out, of, out of 58 counties in the state, we're actually the fourth most dangerous county to ride a bike. And so um, these kinds of, uh, you know, relatively low cost solutions where we just help people understand uh, where an existing alternative exists um, the, or it already is, um, is a strategy that we're exploring. So is it just signs then or what is, what is it? it? Would probably, yeah, it would primarily be signs. I mean, we could look at some other um you know potentially low cost infrastructure but um in order to do something quickly and cheaply we'd probably start with the signs and if the route is um well traveled or if you know other issues become uh, apparent we could then look at some infrastructure uh, that we could put in as well thank you yeah sure all right um i'm not going to call on mr riddle unless you're able to uh, give me a first name there that we can um, validate or if you or turn on your camera. Uh, I'm going to go to Kaylin next. Hello. Um, I just had a quick question. You mentioned an Emmeline encampment that was uh, recently cleaned out. And uh, I think you mentioned that some work was done to prevent the um, to prevent trash from going into the waterways. Did I hear that right? Yeah, um, the encampment was pretty close to the creek, and uh, and you know the the creek bed is pretty shallow there. So what they did was uh, increase, basically build some sort of emergency berms levees to prevent the trash from actually flowing into the river uh when when we got those january storms so they actually prevented most of the trash from from going into the waterway uh is there any cost associated with that infrastructure that had to go in or any idea as to uh the amount of trash there any type of ballpark figure to to clean it up any cost i remember i think it was 2.5 million for the bench lands i think you mentioned i was just wondering if there's any cost associated with emmeline as well yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, the Emmeline cleanup is probably about $60,000. Um, and uh, the one reason why the San Lorenzo Benchlands encampment cleanup cost so much more was part of that $2.5 million was also uh, housing vouchers for people um, so that we could actually find them a, a place to move to rather than just telling them to leave. Okay. Okay, great. And then the care court is not in effect here in Santa Cruz yet, right? We're not one of the pilot counties. That, that's correct. Yeah. So, I mean, the care court, which is basically, you know, beginning of a mandatory care program for, po for people suffering um, from behavioral health issues. Um, the governor was originally talking about rolling it out all across the state all at once. And but with basically no additional funding. Um, and so the coalition of counties basically said, hey, that sounds like a terrible idea. Um, why don't we like pilot this in a yeah. few specific areas first? And so some of the bigger jurisdictions volunteered to start like San Francisco. Um, and so that's why we're basically watching their progress and learning. Um, you know, even the care court process by which uh, someone has to be co uh, contacted and then show up to court and then basically get a care program prescribed is pretty complicated. And so if there are opportunities to uh, improve that, we wanna know before rolling it out in more counties. Totally. Has there been any measurable results yet or is it still too early in the process? Uh, I haven't heard any yet. Um, you know, I'm happy to share them as we learn, but I think it's pretty early. I mean, I literally just began this at the beginning of this year. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Kaylin. All right, Mr. Riddle, go ahead. Hey, can you hear me okay? 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks for yeah, turning on. My last me. name is actually Riddle, and yeah, it gets me a lot of problems. It's uh, Scott Riddle. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> but um, this is an uncomfortable question, but I think it's uh, one that many people in the community are um, worried about and 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 concerned about, and that is we're a small town, and I moved here from Los Angeles, but originally come from the Midwest about eight years ago. And I'm, you know, very vested in the community now. And I'm one of those people who uh, takes the time to gather my own knowledge. And so when I've encountered dozens of different homeless people on the streets, I'll walk up to them and I'll say, hey, where are you from? What's your story? And I've yet to meet one person from Santa Cruz, let alone from California. That being said, how are we responsible for the misjudgments of people from all around the country that are coming here without the resources to be um, productive members of the community. Because in my mind, all the money that we're putting out that I don't really see any positive results from could be invested in the working poor and our teachers and people that have trouble affording rent locally and taking care of our local homeless people instead of encouraging people from coming all over the country to um, create the situation that we're dealing with right now? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a, a fair question. Um, I know a lot of people share that concern and, and myself as well. I mean, we, to some extent, we, we obviously cannot take care of, um, you know, every person experiencing homelessness throughout the entire country. Um, I would say the issue is a, a little bit more complicated than that. And, and we do run a, a, a homeward bound program and try to connect people uh, with their families and give out bus vouchers uh, for people Great. to return to where they came from. Um, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I believe it was over 100 vouchers or for the homeward bound program that we gave out last year alone. Wow. Great. Um, the, you know, however, it's not like, everyone is just coming to California too. I mean, it will, because of the weather, I mean, certainly it's a factor, but you know, Portland, Seattle also have huge yeah. problems. The weather is a lot worse. Yes. Um, you know, reports that are studies that have really dug into this show that actually the biggest uh, correlation between uh, or to, to homelessness is high housing prices. And yes. so, you know, I, I mean, I don't disagree that some of the most visible people on our streets are suffering from mental illness and could be from all parts of the country. Um, but uh, it, at the end of the day, it's that the, our high housing prices, which, as you said, are impacting teachers. Uh, they're, heck, it's impacting our, the county's ability to hire people. Yes. Uh, um, you know, for even our behavioral health services, we have a 30 percent vacancy right now in mental uh, health clinician positions because, wow. because the cost of living is so out of whack here that we, we can't recruit people from outside of the county, not easily at least. Um, so, you know, it's, we've, we're in a kind of a deep hole here from all kinds of compounding issues, right? Uh, lack of housing growth. Um, we, both our state and federal government have not consistently funded homelessness. So right now our county has to compete for, uh, all these different grants. Um, I mean, I think we're managing over 42 different grants right now. Wow. Uh, and none of them is like they're not on the same time schedule. They're all like some is one, some are one year grants, some are three year grants. We've got to do reporting for all of them. Some might not be there after the next cycle. So it is, I mean, there's just a ton of challenges right now, for sure. Um, we're trying to just, you know, put our heads down and, and move through it one step at a time. Um, getting more behavioral health resources online, as I mentioned, uh, we'll bring 55 new housing units. Um, online this year for vets um, and great transition age youth specifically. Um, you know, where we've focused, we have been able to really reduce homelessness. Um, so we saw a 95% reduction in youth and family uh, homelessness in the last, um, during the last point in time count, because we really prioritize providing shelter resources and getting vouchers to that group. Um, and, uh, but you know, 
we continue to see challenges like seniors. We saw an 82% increase in uh, homeless seniors because um, it's a, you know folks' pensions or retirement savings are not keeping up with inflation and housing. Yeah. So, yes. I mean, I'm and kind of I, I, all I, over the place here, but it's just it is a you know there's a lot of a lot of pieces to it, and um, you know we are definitely trying to get people back to their homes all over the country, um, but it's not the only thing going on. Understood. And, you know, the, the thing is that the community is losing compassion, I think, because we see the worst case scenario in regards to the encampments and how those encampments and the, the various, you know, mentally ill treat the land and then, of course, treat you. And I was really shocked when I moved here because I lived in Los Angeles for so long. I've lived around the world. And the first time in, in a long time that I actually felt threatened by a homeless person was in downtown Santa Cruz. And it was this different breed. There was this entitlement, this, this benevolence that I had never encountered before, because usually if you tell, if I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm all plastic today, I don't have any money, but acknowledge them kindly, that was that. But the aggression and the, the edgy drugginess to the homeless population that tends to make people not want to go downtown was so shocking to me. Coming from Los Angeles, I'm saying this. So um, yeah, it, it, and you hate to lose empathy for, uh, uh, you know, to your fellow humans, but I think I'm speaking for a lot of people. And um, yeah, so you gave me a lot of good answers. Thank you for that. But I also think that somehow we may need to, and I know it's against national laws, we may need to, come up with some kind of system to make sure that as, as often as we can, that we are actually putting our resources into helping our local people and ensuring our senior and veterans care first and getting people to understand that this isn't, this isn't an easy place to come and just absorb benefits and crap up our environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we, we are trying to also be clear about uh, you know, the reality of what resources we have here. So for example, we're reforming um, the way that we are sort of the housing list that people get on. Um, and, you know, in the past, we, we basically just put everyone on the list and said, you know, you'll hear from us at some point. Uh, now we're being much more transparent about the fact that, hey, we've got whatever, five beds and sorry, you're number 25 and, you know, don't meet the, you, you, we don't even put you on the list if, <laughs> if you right. don't meet the, the qualifications. Right. Um, so we still are working with people, but a lot of that process is shifting from, um, you know, just putting people on the list to let's look at what resources you have available to you that you might not be leveraging or aware of, you know, Mark. where are your family? Um, you know, what skills do you have? Um, you know, do you need a driver's license? How can we problem solve and, and kind of get folks just to the next step? So that's let's... great. I thank you so much. You've really answered a lot. I did vote for you, by the way. <laughs> thank you. And I'll let you get back to um, the rest of the business. Thank you so much. Good, good questions. Nice to meet you, Mr. Riddle. Thank you. You too. You'll see more of me. Right. Uh, Cheryl Clifford, you're next. Yes. Hi, Supervisor. Thank you first for oh. us and trying to keep us all informed of so many issues that we're all challenged with. Um, my question comment is about the chipping program. Um, apparently there's two of them and we, I did take a snapshot of the one that you shared earlier. We're going to definitely call, um, and try to sign up for it. Um, apparently there's a second one. We tried to get on there last year and either our area wasn't listed or, um, and I know there's a few other people on here that I've seen on the 95033. We're all asking about the chipping program. How do we manage to get all the debris that has fallen and, and you know, how do we kind of manage that? So. I'm hoping that we're in the area that's um, you know eligible, and that there's also funding to have it. Apparently, it's very expensive, and you know we understand that. So I'm, I'm hoping that on, on both counts that we're eligible, and that there's enough money to come up here and help us out a little bit. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think there's two 
types of chipping program. The, um, the first is that basically you sign up. Uh, I think this is the program that is opening on in April. Uh, and the Resource Conservation District basically just brings the chipper out to you and it's it's a no cost program. Um, the second is uh, you you basically have to sign up with your neighbors. Uh, I think it has to be a minimum of eight parcels. And um, I think then you get actually get reimbursed for that. So you do the work and then um, apply for reimbursement. And then that program typically happens a little later in the year. Definitely hear what you're saying as far as the increased need out there from after all these storms. Um, so I'll definitely work with the RCD and talk to county staff about uh, how we can potentially expand these programs, either to serve more people or a bigger area or uh, last longer. Great, thank you, we appreciate it. Thank you. Mike Pisano. Hi, thank you, uh, Supervisor Koenig. Um, on the, the bike lanes up there, Prospect Heights, is Brookwood Drive gonna be uh, two lanes or is it still gonna be one way? For the bikes yeah um definitely creating two-way travel for bikes on brookwood is is a goal right and in some ways in some ways this um, designating a bike boulevard through here just to get people using the route would be is a, is a starting point right you know um kind of thinking about uh destination points downtown is certainly one of them and so that Brookwood drive route, which is past, for those of you who don't know, past Dominican, uh, and it's that little connector that's one way between um, Prospect Heights and Dominican, it kind of goes down over uh, Arana Creek. Um, yeah, there are some potential options to make it two ways for bikes and pedestrians, um, but we figured, yeah, start with this as phase one, and then it would require a little bit more infrastructure Right. Uh, you know, at least the creation of a, of a walking path. There's an old fire road there that we're looking at could, could potentially be an option, but uh, kind of a phase two of the project. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, again, if you if it's something that interests you or that you would use, um, go ahead and email uh, me at the first district at Santa Cruz County US and Martine Watkins. Uh, I don't have her email in front of me right now, but you can find it on the city of Santa Cruz site. I think it's something like M. Watkins, it, but you, you're better off looking it up. All right, uh, thanks, Mike. Junior Edwards, go ahead. Hi, um, I hate to be a broken record, but where are we on the status of Kaiser or did I miss that in the beginning? Uh, I didn't touch on it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it now. I just, because it's uh, the focus here is De La Viega more. Um, but yeah, so Kaiser, I actually haven't heard anything recently, um, at least, I, I think you were at the January town hall meeting, right? With, right. Where, yeah, so there actually has not been any new information uh, that I've received since then. Um, the process of events that needs to happen is first the final environmental impact report needs to be released. And then sometime, uh, around right after that um, the developer applicant uh, would host a community meeting they're required to do that under our code um, at once they've done that uh, and at that meeting they'll talk a little bit more about the uh, traffic impact mitigation projects that they're looking at um, and then after that the planning commission would hold a hearing uh, to consider the permit and the environmental impact report. Uh, and then after that, it could come to the Board of Supervisors. So the two official public hearings where there'd be a vote would be the uh, Planning Commission meeting and the Board of Supervisors. Um, and then, we still don't know what you're gonna do on Gross Road because um, the, the public was opposed to the uh, the barrier at the end of Gross Road and and you said you would work on it and haven't heard anything since then. Yeah, um, and I'm not sure exactly where the applicant, where um, you know the, the folks building the building are on this. Um, you know, I, what we did say to them was that um, they're one way or another, we want to see a traffic light go in at South Rodeo Gulch so that if that gross road, um, SoCal Ave 
intersection is impacted, that um, the, the neighborhood has, you know, an, an alternative route where they can also get um, some dedicated access. So that is um, one, one particular improvement that, um, you know, I'm committed to making sure we get. Okay, well, I'd like to hear when closer to it, what's going on. So don't have Absolutely. to read a 900 yeah. page report again. I'm sorry, what a 900 or something again? I had to read the transportation oh, section of that ER yeah. report was 900 pages. Yeah, I, it's insane. I, I agree with you on that. And Jamie, did you have something you wanted to add to this? Hi, everyone. I have a message from the chat I'd like to read. Okay. I just so, read on, on a different okay. topic. Oh, okay. Thank on you. Topic. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Are we ready for our next one? Um, I, I guess so, but just to, I'll certainly let everyone know um, is Edwards as soon as uh, we have more information and when the developer plans to host a meeting. All right, Jamie, go ahead. All right, this is from Kathy McKinney. What can we do in the mountains to get county help cleaning up the sides of the roads from the snowstorm? Neighbors have piled their storm debris along the sides of the roads in Villa del Monte and our roads are single lane in places as a result. Residents are expecting some help to deal with it. Can we get FEMA funding? We have a nonprofit that deals with fire prevention in the neighborhood. Can you help us? Uh, so yeah, for those locations, um, go ahead and, and send us the specific locations at first.district at santacruzcounty.us uh, and we'll work with Public Works to get them cleared. I, assuming it's a county maintained road, I think the villas are at least majority county maintained. Um, I don't know if I'm uh, unmuted right yeah, now. Yeah, we can we can hear you, Kathy. Go ahead. Yes, we are uh, county maintained roads. I mean, sort of. <laughs> right, I, I hear you. A lot of this is tree tunnels. I'm Kathy's husband, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> a lot of this is where there was tunnels over the tops of the road. We talked about them on here in terms of fire safety before, mm -hmm. and I think. Mother Nature kind of agreed with the need for them to be trimmed, and a lot of that just came down into the road, and it's all along the sides of the road now. So yeah, this is a great solution. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So please do uh, email me and the the team with those specific locations, and we'll we'll get with Public Works on clearing them out. We'll, we'll do. do. Thank you, Manu. Yeah. Thank you both. Anyone else have questions or Jamie, is there any other questions in the, the chat that we can answer? I don't have any other messages in the chat. Okay. Um, well, we'll just put our uh, e office email address up here on the screen one more time. Uh, as we close this first district at Santa Cruz County us the best way to reach really all of us, including Jamie and Shane and myself who are on the call tonight, uh, as well as Christina Clavis, another analyst who uh, couldn't make it. Um, but uh, that is, will get you the fastest service from us. So thank you all for joining tonight. It was a pleasure to talk with you and hear from you. And uh, we'll have another, oh, Christina is here. Hi, Christina. Um, we'll have another one of these next month. Christina, do you actually know where the, you want to tell us where the location is and what the date? Yes, the location will be at the um, the Sheriff Center in the community room. And let me get the exact date so I don't get it wrong. It will be April, oops, is that right? Guys, give me one, one more second here. April 20th um, at 6 p.m. at the Santa, at the uh, sheriff's office, at the community room there. Great. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe in the storm. And good night. Good night.